Aloha Friday. Welcome to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies here with another Stan the Energy Man show and a really, really special guest who's been a good friend of mine since uh, I was in the guard and he was in the guard. And we both guarded Hawaii for many, many years and kept it safe for all of you. So that's why you sleep so well at night, because the National Guard is protecting you. My guest today is Congressman Mark Takai. And uh, he's uh, going to come talk to us a little bit about energy. Um, and I, I'm almost embarrassed to say that I still drive a gas-powered vehicle. Although it is a Mini Cooper and it doesn't take much gas, I rode my bike over here today. Well, that was the one consolation I made. But Mark has been driving a battery plug-in vehicle for probably at least five years now. Yep, I just made five years uh, a couple days ago. So he's, he's a transportation, <laughs> clean transportation guy from way back. And, and I want to thank you, A, for yes, being on the you. show. Thanks. It's, it's awesome to have you here. And also thank you all the way back when you were a rep in the Hawaii legislature for all the work that you did with HCAT on mm -hmm. putting legislation sure. through in Hawaii to, to help us out. So welcome well, back home thank this you. week. And thank you so good much. Good to have you on. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I've been meaning to uh, join you. I know you've made the offer for maybe the last five months, uh, ever since you began this show. Um, um, but today I'm so grateful to have this opportunity. So thanks for having me on the show. Oh, good to have you here. Well, this week we had, uh, we had Congressman Takai come out to Hickam and look mm -hmm. at some of the stuff we, we have going on at Hickam just to get him up to speed, as I like to do with all of our congressional delegation when mm -hmm. we have the chance. Show him what we're doing at Hickam with the Air Force so they understand uh, what's going on. So we, have, we took some pictures here, and we're going to bring them up on the screen and talk to them. So this is uh, actually a Volcanoes National Park bus that, uh, that the congressman came out to visit, and I was explaining to him how the fuel cell works and, and how, it, uh, how big it has to be and the kind of things we have to deal with on, on these vehicles. So what do you think of uh, our shop? And Yeah, I'm very impressed. In fact, um, you know, one, one of the things that I learned uh, that day was um, you're actually taking an electric, um, uh, not electric, a, uh, a regular engine, a regular uh, vehicle, gas, gas powered and, and converting it. And uh, uh, it is remarkable. I mean, I've had an opportunity to ride in the one that it's, is at Hickam, but I think that once the Volcanoes National Park has the opportunity to uh, get these out into their fleet, um, you know, people are going to be uh, more mindful of what you're doing and, and really uh, to, to, to be able to understand hydrogen-powered vehicles, you have to ride in one. Right. And, and I think we're talking, too, about some of the training we have to do with the, the drivers because it is new technology. Right. So, for example, at the Volcano Park, they mostly will run this on level ground between mm -hmm. the Thurston Lava Tube and the Visitor Center. But what would happen is when they go down the long hill, you know from your car right. you have regenerative, regenerative braking, braking right. so they get to charge their batteries so we don't want them to run their their uh, high, their their um, fuel cell right. and keep their batteries topped off we want them to wear their batteries down to a lower level then right go down before. the hill right. so it's a little bit of driving technology <clears throat> sure so we showed a little bit of the um, the um, also our dump truck that we have there and then now we're out at Hickam actually looking at our waste energy plant that you toured when you're out at Hickam and uh, most people are just like, wow, we didn't expect 10 tons a day to be so big. Right. Uh, each power in, in Honolulu is 3,000 tons a day. This is only a 10 ton a day system, but you know, you got to see it up, up close and personal, and it's, it's a pretty good sized piece of equipment. But what, what do you think about that kind of stuff? Well, it's important for Hawaii as an island state to uh, be focused on waste to energy. Uh, we, we produce a lot of our own waste, whether it's uh, municipal solid waste, which is our regular trash, or construction waste, or green waste, uh, you know, whatever it is. And, and most of it, unfortunately, is still going into the landfill, although we have diverted quite a bit uh, to H Power, uh, which, which does something similar. But your technology is something that I've been looking forward to for the last 10 years. Uh, People have been talking about waste to energy and, and converting the waste into syngas, which then can be converted into electricity um, that can be uh, connected to the grid. And um, you have it uh, at Hickam, and um, it, is, it is extremely exciting to see it. Yeah. We're trying to <clears throat> integrate that waste energy plant into a bigger microgrid system mm -hmm. in the future. That's our next project coming up. And what you're seeing on the screen now is actually a picture of some of the hydrogen storage that we have at our hydrogen station out at Hickam. 
And people say, well, you, I guess you're moving away from hydrogen vehicles and into microgrid Stan. And I go, no, actually, what we're going to show is that hydrogen used in a microgrid for energy storage is also really valuable because, you know, for batteries, batteries are very heavy, they're right. very expensive, and they're hard to move. They're very, they're dense and they're big, and so they weigh a lot. But when you store in hydrogen, you, once you, you put it in the tank, it lasts right, pretty much right. forever. And so you can move it easier, and we're going to actually use hydrogen a lot in the energy storage part of the Absolutely. microgrid and run generators off of the hydrogen and run flight line vehicles mm -hmm. off the hydrogen and, and <coughs> use it in the microgrid to show the flexibility. So I think one of the things that, I've, that we can talk about a little bit is when you start to get real s conscious or sensitive about energy, you begin to see that energy and energy management isn't just gasoline or diesel or electric. It's, now how do we make all these things work together? Right. So, like for the hydrogen, when you're making hydrogen as, in an electrolyzer, you're making pure oxygen that's used in medical, can right. be used in the medical field, can be used for welding. When you're doing, you can do hydrogen from, from, um, from algae. So if you take the waste energy plant, which I, I said makes a little bit of CO2, and you take that CO2 and pump it into the algae farm, that feeds the algae the CO2 they need to make hydrogen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you start to think energy and think of how these things all plug together, now your mind just starts growing right. and how all these things can work and you can get rid of your rubbish, mm -hmm. you can store energy, you can uh, get, get fuels <coughs> that you normally would have to buy from outside right. another country. The economic impact of why buying fossil fuels is huge. We can take care of a multitude of problems or challenges by looking at alternative energy sources. Right. I'm, I'm really excited about hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, uh, we're finally getting the first one on the commercial mar market through Toyota. It's called the uh, Mirai. And uh, it, it, in fact, it started rolling off <clears throat> the dealers uh, just a few weeks ago in California, and we should be getting ours uh, in the next few months. Uh, the biggest challenge we have right now is the availability of hydrogen as a power source, because uh, there's nothing right now available except for at Hickam and, station and, 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 and the Kaneohe station on, on the Marine Base. Um, so one of the bills I introduced uh, a few years ago in the legislature, which we were kind of working on, is trying to find uh, the possibility or, or trying to fund the possibility of three um, hydrogen fuel generation plants uh, powered by a microgrid. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand that you guys have been moving forward on, on the possibility uh, this session, and that's very exciting because as you're demonstrating in uh, Hickam, um, if you can kind of encapsulate uh, your waste to energy with a microgrid and, and the, uh, the hydrogen uh, um, generator uh, with a microgrid, um, the benefits of that is using hydrogen as the battery. And, and right, you don't have to have batteries. You produce hydrogen mm -hmm. that then eventually goes into cars and then they drive for what, 250? 250, 250 yeah, the Mirai is supposed to go over 300 mm -hmm. miles on uh, one fill up. Right. And it's only about not even five kilograms of hydrogen in the Mirai. So you can imagine that, uh, that eventually people are going to go, wow, this. Right. And I think Toyota made the, the corporate decision. Right. And they helped. They jumped I mean, the, over. Yeah, right. the, the Prius was their hybrid and their battery plug in. Test bed, right. and they worked with Tesla to develop his batteries for mm -hmm. the for the Tesla Elon Musk, but Toyota made a corporate decision about a year ago and said, you know what, hydrogen is the way to right. go. And I tell people that you know we do the big trucks, and they're all hydrogen fuel cell powered. They have batteries, they can go about 30 miles just on their batteries. Mm -hmm. But if you had a big truck and you wanted to move freight, and you wanted to move it more than 40 or 50 miles. The batteries required to, for a heavy torque, you know, big horsepower vehicle mm -hmm. would outweigh. I mean, you have so many batteries, you wouldn't have room right. for, for cargo. <clears throat> so the hydrogen piece is important, but it doesn't mean we don't need batteries. We do need batteries. Batteries smooth out the power. Batteries take up quick right. surges. Hydrogen can't react that fast. Right. There's a lot of good things, but it's it's one of the reasons why we're so focused on hydrogen. And I appreciate it, right. especially in the past legislative sessions when you're in the in the state side. The, the emphasis you put on, even mm -hmm. though you drive a battery plug-in, the emphasis you still put on hydrogen, because I know you understand right, that. Right, right. We're, we're actually still looking at that. I don't think, uh, unless it passed last, last year, uh, to, to allow for hydrogen-powered vehicles to be considered electric vehicles. Did that, did that pass yet? It's in this session again. Okay, I great. Think it's, I think <clears throat> it's making its way through. 
Yeah, so I think people don't understand. I mean, you had to educate me um, that the new hydrogen-powered vehicles are actually electric vehicles. Right. And the electric vehicles now have certain benefits, uh, you know, whether it's parking or um, uh, riding in, in the HOV, lane. HOV mm -hmm. lanes. And we want to make sure that once the Mirai comes on board that the, um, they'll be considered electric vehicles as well. So that's, that's an important bill. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it through, and hopefully uh, they'll be able to get it through. I wanted to go back, though, to um, sure. um, just generally, you know, why I think this is important. Um, I have a number of priorities. Education, higher education, cost of um, college affordability, very important. You know, focusing on our seniors and saving Social Security and Medicare is very important. But my number one priority is, is and was and continues to be sustainability. Mm -hmm. And for an island state to be, uh, to be importing, and I know these figures are a little bit uh, old because of the dip in oil prices, but the last time I looked, we we're still importing $9 billion in foreign fossil fuel and food, uh, $7 billion in fuel and $2 billion in food. The more we can grow ourselves, the more uh, protein that we can, we can make here in Hawaii, whether it's uh, fish or livestock or, or in some cases plants. Vegetables and plants, right, yeah. uh, The better off we'll be. We only have six days' worth of food in, on Oahu. Mm -hmm. um, so if we have a natural or man-made disaster, We'll be all eating MREs on the seventh day, unless. And the guard only has so many. <laughs> <laughs> but the other part of the equation is fuel. Uh, uh, Seven billion dollars a year uh, being exported from our economy is is tremendous. So when we start looking at waste to energy, we're using feedstock into a power generation system that we normally just throw away. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing better than that. You know, and like I said, I've been looking at it for the past 10 years. I've been encouraging it. Um, I know the focus is, is mainly on the counties because they, they take care of our munis munis municipal, municipal waste. solid waste. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but there's a role to, role to play in the DOD. Yes. And I'm glad you're working uh, on this pilot at Hickam because uh, uh, for um, uh, power stability, um, for security reasons, uh, you know, all the bases are looking at uh, the possibility of creating power generation plants. Right. And there's nothing like, even in, even in the case of natural disasters, there's nothing like being able to create a power source with rubbish. Mm -hmm. So it's very encouraging. Yeah, all the services, all the components are, are heavy into renewables now. Mm -hmm. The Navy is w looking at, at renewables and microgrids at Pearl Harbor Hickam. The uh, Army has a new right. power generation thing up at Schofield. And we're actually HCAT and Afro. Are, They're looking are, at biofuels for that still, or did they? I, I think yeah, so. Okay. I haven't. I don't follow the army too much, yeah. but the Navy and uh, the Air Force are right. starting to collaborate more and more at Hickam with uh, NAFAC on the things we're doing in microgrid. So that's that's good. But you know, you, you hit on something really important. I, I keep harping on the fact that the economic impact to Hawaii, the negative economic impact of importing right. such a huge amount of of oil. That's all money leaving, leaving the state that's that's killing our economy right. and would we could be using to create more jobs. Right. As a former Hawaii legislator and now as someone in Congress, give me some advice on how I convince our legislature that they need to just be a little bit more forward thinking and help us get our state fleets and our county fleets to move towards hydrogen and it'll take some investment. Not a huge investment. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking at nine billion dollars right. worth of import versus I need 10, 10 million to set up a couple stations for our, our fleets, for our state fleets. How do I make that argument to the legislature? I, I, I think you got to show them examples. And, you know, the, the, the fact that I went out with you and w was able to see some of what you're doing, uh, very impressive, by the way, but it, it helps. It connects the dots. Um, I think uh, when um, Surfco puts up their, their uh, hydrogen fuel station, and I'm assuming it's going to be powered by a microgrid as well. Um, They're actually running it off of their PV. Okay, perfect. So, um, you know, when you, when you put that whole system into uh, a, a separate and independent off-the-grid type of situation, then I think people go, yes, I got it. Okay. See, for my car, I don't have the ability to, uh, to create energy, um, to create electricity, except for my, my solar panels. Mm -hmm. And as you know... Um, 
solar panels are producing electricity during the day, and I, I power my car late at night. Okay. I, I'm on the uh, time of use EV okay. um, uh, system with uh, Hawaiian Electric. Um, so I'm taking from the grid at a, at a low peak time, but I'm still not directly taking it mm -hmm. from the sun. You know, I, I think my car still is powered by the sun because it, it works out that way. Um, but when you do what you're going to do, uh, it'll definitely be mm -hmm. a, uh, a vehicle powered exclusively, exclusively by the sun. And then we can start talking about uh, the decrease of our reliance on importing foreign fossil fuels. Um, I think when people see that, that's an aha moment. It, it, it's totally an aha moment because you're not connected to the grid. You're powering these vehicles um, uh, through, through the sun and, yeah. and through the creation of hydrogen, which is uh, from what? Water. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's beautiful. Great. Mm -hmm. well, we're up on our first break, so we're going to take a quick short break here and be back with Congressman Mark Kai after a few. Aloha, this is Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We're here to inform, motivate, and entertain you. Join us. Hola, soy Maria Mera, y estoy aquí para invitaros a mi show bilingüe, Viva Hawaii en Think Tech Hawaii, cada dos lunes a las 3 de la tarde. Estamos aquí para informaros, motivaros y entreteneros. Apuntaros. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel, that's Ray Starling. We co-host the show called Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. You know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He asks them these questions and all this stuff tumbles out. And we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's questions. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your um, Ed McMahon uh, <laughs> every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world. And there is a lot going on. So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around. Be energized right here on Think Tech. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stand the Energy Man on my lunch hour with Congressman Mark Takai, who we're talking energy and trying to figure out how to convince the legislature that they need to do their due diligence and their fair share of showing off these technologies so that uh, we start adopting faster. And some good ideas. I think you're right. Seeing is believing. And when we get more people out there, and, and I try and give as many tours as I can, like the one I gave you, and uh, we, we do it all over. But there's mm -hmm. other folks out there. Like you say, Surfco is leaning forward. Mm -hmm. They took a huge risk. And um, Toyota Hawaii, actually, uh, Surfco brought in Fibrize already. They're on the island. And they're, they're telling me they're going to actually have uh, even more by the end of the year. And probably next year they'll look at how they're going to market them. Right now they're, they're not planning on selling any of the ones that they have or leasing them. They're going to use them for demonstrators Perfect. and get it out there. But they're in the mm -hmm. papers. They're advertising already. They have the Mirai on, on, on advertising. So they're mm -hmm. doing great. But yeah. I, you know, I think uh, when I first got my electric vehicle, um, and even before, it, it took about two years, I think, for us to get it. You know, we, we did what, what they call, I think, early hand raising. And, Type my name in, paid 95 bucks or whatever, and that was a process for the Nissan Leaf. Um, but even to this day, you know, there's people out there going, "Man, does it have power?" I said, "Does it have power? Yeah. This thing has more power than your gas vehicle, and I think I can beat you off off the starting line." They're like, "Really?" I said, "Yeah, it's almost like driving a, a golf cart, electric golf cart. When you put your foot to the pedal, it just takes off." You yeah. know. Um, and I think people just need to be more familiar with the technology. I had a chance to uh, drive the Mirai. I actually drove it uh, in DC. Um, they let me drive it for maybe like two blocks. <laughs> um, and it drives just like my Nissan Leaf. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's, it's, it's an electric vehicle. Um, and they showed me the exhaust, and it was water coming out yeah. of um, the back end. It's pretty impressive. It is impressive. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, great. Yeah, people don't realize I, I have a Tesla story because, you know, I have my Mini Cooper and I'm up at Ruger mm -hmm. and I'm going home and I get on the freeway and I pull up next to a Tesla. He thinks I'm racing him in my Mini Cooper and he, he just took oh, off. Yeah. I was doing 60 <clears throat> and he just lit the burners and he was gone right. and I, I just went, holy macro. Yeah. And I knew, I, I could see the little T on the back and I go, that's an electric car. And he started at 60 and walked away from me. Yeah. Um, I was really impressed and from Te that point Tesla's on... Tesla's a beautiful vehicle, yeah. but it's not for everybody. I mean, right. I, I have a lot of friends that own Teslas now, um, 
it's still, the price point's pretty high. Yeah. Um, but the next Tesla they're coming out with is going to be about 35000 at 200 plus miles. The next Nissan Leaf coming out, I think 2017, is going to be about there too. Um, the Mirai, I think, is right there as well, maybe a little bit higher. Um, but it comes with free hydrogen. <coughs> free hydrogen, in California, free, right? You know, free hydrogen. Um, so I, I, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's affordable. I mean, I, um, I lease mine, so I'm driving actually my third one. I don't know if you know that. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh huh. Um, this one is a three-year lease. The others were two-year leases, and uh, it's just, it's just the way the technology was. I made the decision uh, because of the battery uh, technology to just lease it. So. You know, I don't know what I'm going to get in uh, in two more years because I just made one more year for for my uh, third vehicle, um, but I I can't afford a hundred thousand yeah. dollar car. Yeah. You know, I can afford a thirty something thousand dollar car because of the savings, and it works out. So I think uh, you know people out there are going to take notice. And uh, the great thing about the Mirai, the great thing about a hydrogen fueled vehicle, is that unlike mine that takes a few hours at a level two charger. Um, uh, what is the charge on the Mirai? Like five minutes or two most, minutes? Yeah, between three and five minutes. Yeah, so it's almost like pumping yeah. gas. Oh yeah, it's you know very much, and that's one of the big selling points. Right. The experience, whether it's driving or whether it's fueling, is very much like what people are used to. Right. I mean, we have level three chargers now. I can plug in in certain places, and it it, it I can top off in maybe twenty minutes, which is great. Um, but I usually charge at night on level two, and it takes what six hours or eight hours. Um, so I think that's a benefit to hydrogen-powered vehicles. Yeah, and I think that the, the technology is getting lighter, cheaper, smaller. It, it, we're getting to the point now where when we start getting into mass, more mass production of vehicles, mm -hmm. then yeah, the price absolutely. point drops quite mm -hmm. a bit. And uh, what we really need is the infrastructure. Right. And that's where I'm trying to work. Last absolutely. year, the, the legislature did pass last year an act that makes my position at HCAT the hydrogen implementation coordinator for the state. Good. And in that, it gives me <coughs> some leverage to get out and reach out to the private sector. And there, there, I can't really talk a lot about what some of the private sector folks are doing because they don't want it, they don't want to come out yet with what they're doing. But there's a lot going on in our community where hydrogen is being put mm -hmm. in place and used regularly on a daily basis with current technology and an eye towards the future. And I think the people in Hawaii are going to lead the way and, and take go right past California right. as uh, as hydrogen well, I, uh, and electric car leadership. I, I think in terms of electric cars per capita, we have the highest, and it makes sense because Hawaii again is an island state, and the the range <clears throat> of 80 to 100 for a Nissan Leaf and now a Tesla at about two 250. Um, it's very difficult to own a car like that, 100 percent right. uh, powered by um, either. Uh, um, electric or hydrogen, you know, where they're driving for hundreds of miles unless you have refueling spots. Um, so I, I think we are going to continue to lead the way. Um, I, I just think that uh, the role of government um, at all levels, county, state, and federal, is to lead the way. You know, we wouldn't be in the uh, situation we are as uh, leading in electric vehicles per capita had it not been for the support that we got from the state government. If you recall, the very first uh, purchases had a, a tax rebate right. uh, tied into the ARA money around 09, uh, 2010, um, and that helped encourage purchases. Uh, in the case of um, hydrogen fuel, um, we, we need to uh, encourage um, governments to, to build the fuel stations because they're not cheap. Um, and you have to be able to provide the fuel. And one of these days, uh, we're going to see it where it, it dips low enough so that, you know, the, um, the gas stations right on the corners will be uh, powering through hydrogen as well. We're not there yet because right. the, uh, the, the, uh, the economies don't match yet, but we'll get there. And if it's not for government leading this way, uh, we wouldn't even have electric vehicles. Now, yeah. private private investors and what they do and, and the, the, the automobile industry as well uh, needs to push. But without government's help, unfortunately, um, we're not going to get there. So One of my <laughs> early success stories working in HCAT was I was talking to the Department of Energy, and they contracted Idaho National Labs to do a feasibility study here in Hawaii. And the feasibility study centered around GSA, 
federal right. vehicles. So the GSA, for people <coughs> that don't know, they lease vehicles to the military, to the mm -hmm. FBI, to any of the federal agencies out here. Um, and it's, it's a fairly, not fairly, it's a really large program. And that's how the government kind of uh, tries to implement change and, and do things with their fleet vehicles is to do it through the GSA. Mm -hmm. What Idaho National Labs did was they took a 1.4 acre parcel across from the federal building called uh, Fort Armstrong. And we designed a solar array and a hydrogen station that went in there and cost, costed it against gas. So we took a gallon gas equivalent and we ended up building the station and it was within 50 cents a gallon of what gas was going for when it was in the $4.50 right. range. That was the first time we ever had a model anywhere that said you might be able to make money at this in the private sector if you did this. And it didn't include a, sl a slurpy stand or I mean mm -hmm. it didn't have a quick stop type of, right. of uh, venue with it so if you put that piece in you could even make money doing this stuff it was the first time we had that model but the problem was when we did this we, we didn't realize that GSA leases vehicles and they build buildings but they don't build buildings to support vehicles and they don't put infrastructure to support vehicles I was really happy to see this week that the federal government and GSA have come out now and GSA has a website where where People who use the vehicles can actually log in and learn about charging stations for electric vehicles, hydrogen inf infrastructure for hydrogen vehicles, because they're the ones, the people that use the vehicles have to help build that infrastructure. Right. So that's a big federal uh, step forward as far as I'm concerned. We went from you know, having a, a business plan that we could show the state of Hawaii to now GSA is looking at their model and actually realizing that they've got to help their customers to, to take that step. Because just saying we need 20% of the vehicles to be uh, alternative fuel doesn't get you anywhere if your customers have no way to, to charge them or fuel them. Right, right. So the federal government's really coming, coming ahead now. And I know you, now that you're in Congress, that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other things we're looking forward to on the federal side um, that we can, we can look forward to the federal government helping implement some of these programs? Right. Well, let, let me just tell you, there are significant challenges at the federal level. Um, the oil, oil industry has considerable uh, leverage and influence uh, in the halls of Congress, and they've been working against uh, initiatives uh, for, the, for the new green economy. Um, but having said that, uh, I'm very happy to report that in our budget bill uh, in December, we are able to extend the tax credits uh, for renewables, including uh, PV and the like, uh, for a few more years. That was a big concern because we were going to lose it. So the sure. federal government is continuing the, uh, the tax benefits, um, although it's phase out this time. And I think the next time it comes up, uh, by then we probably don't, we won't need it. But it was important for us to continue it. So that's a good one. That was good news. <clears throat> right, great news, uh, especially for us here in Hawaii. Um, the, the, the second thing we're looking at uh, through, through a bill that I helped co-introduce is uh, fleet vehicles um, specifically for the postal service so you know that's that's exciting because uh, if you know the postal service um, years ago uh, the federal government decided to make the postal service basically uh, uh, self-supporting um, through revenues generated through stamp sales and uh, they've had some challenges because they're the only agency that had to also pay for their future retirement benefits. So we take a look at the Postal Service and you see red all over. Um, it's because of the way the uh, government has kind of uh, determined how they were the, to the calculate yeah, yeah. The, the, the financial structure. Okay. Um, but having said that, um, their vehicles, uh, their fleet um, is uh, probably older than dinosaurs. I mean, they're pretty old. Older than dirt. They're older than dirt. <laughs> and. Uh, one of the oldest fleet vehicles in the federal government. And there's no money. Right. There's no money on the, uh, the Postal Service side. So what we did, and I talked about this even before getting into office, uh, we wanted to use the Postal Service as a pilot okay. uh, for energy efficient vehicles uh, for fleets. Um, and if we do that, because we're going to have to pilot it somewhere else anyway, it could be GSA, it could be the military, uh, what better place to do it than the Postal Service for a number of reasons. One, they can't afford to, uh, to renew their, their fleet. Yeah. Recapitalize their fleet. Recapitalize their fleet. But number two, um, the way that postal vehicles drive, mm -hmm. it's a perfect opportunity exactly. because it's stop, stop and, and go, go stop and, and it's go. slow. Yeah. Um, 
perfect opportunity for renewables and, and, yeah. and these types That's of... That's the worst regime for an internal combustion right. engine operating. Right. So uh, we believe that in the long run there will be significant savings on the fuel side um, and it'll be able, it, they'll be able to recapitalize their fleet um, and it'll be vehicles that people will see everywhere Great. on the road. Well, we're going to take another quick break here and be back in about 60 seconds with Congressman Mark Pekai. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host a show, Climate Change Beyond Outrage. In it, we go beyond outrage to look at solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. Join me every Tuesday at 1 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time. The See grin. You then. Okay. Welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan Energy Man with a very special guest. Congressman Mark Takai is here with us and my old battle buddy from the Hawaii Guard. <laughs> and uh, we're having a good time today talking about things. So we left off talking a little bit about um, converting some of the federal fleets to run off alternative fuels. And Congressman Takai is working on some legislation at the federal level to convert the postal fleet uh, and recapitalize their vehicles into more renewable alternative fuel vehicles. And that is the perfect place to do it. You know, one of the first lessons I got from one of our contractors was the lesson of why hybrid electric vehicles are better than regular internal combustion. The first thing he said is, it's the traffic. It's mm -hmm. the stop and go. Right. It's your, your internal combustion engines are at best probably 30% efficient at their very best. But when you're doing stop and go, you're down in the teens and 10% right. efficient. So postal vehicles, perfect place to start. So let's right. so, more about this program. So they, they have determined that a postal vehicle, the ones that deliver mail to our homes, is averaging about 10 miles to the gallon. Wow unbelievable that's terrible and then we know that electric vehicles and hy hydrogen vehicles are, are about a hundred miles to the gallon and I think that's conservative as well I mean it depends on how you calculate it um, if you're using renewables it's we can make it a thousand miles to the gallon because you're using free free energy coming from the Sun um, <clears throat> so that's got to change uh, there's a lot of money being wasted uh, standing or sitting in traffic, um, or in the case of the Postal Service, stop and go delivering mail. Um, and, and those are the, f the fleet vehicles at the federal level that we want to um, uh, help convert as quickly, quickly as possible because there's tr tremendous cost savings uh, just in that. So when we look at other vehicles that are, that are government fleet vehicles, rubbish trucks come to mind, buses come to mind, things that do stop and go. And, and we have, uh, we're trying to work with the city on one of their uh, trash collection vehicles that we're, we're looking, we're working with HNEI and the Department of Energy to try and convert one of the trash collection vehicles to run off of uh, hydrogen so that they can appreciate sure. the, the savings that you, that you get. And, and that's a good point because I think that um, you had mentioned it earlier about electric vehicles with battery storage right. for a vehicle like that and you'd have most of the the capacity of the, the, the truck being uh, right. battery Batteries. storage. Mm -hmm. And then I saw at your office, um, uh, it was, I think it was a second, second photo, uh, you showing me where the actual hydrogen fuel tank is uh, on that side of that Mack truck. It was, um, yeah, it's right here. It's, uh, it, you have two of those tanks. Right. Uh, you have the... Uh, 10 kilograms total. You have that, the labels right there. That's the storage mm -hmm. tank. Um, protected by those rails um, and that's a huge vehicle and right. I, I never knew it until I saw that particular vehicle um, that something like a garbage truck could actually be a hydrogen powered sure. garbage truck so uh, you know I, I, I will I will help you I mean I hope the city moves in that direction um, 
you can you can you can actually retrofit it, right? Sure. Your your your, uh, your program can do it, and sure. uh, you know we we need to see it. That's right. That's why I always keep on saying. I mean, you know the 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 um, auto show which is coming up in a few weeks. Um, actually, it might be Pretty next soon. week. Next week already. Um, uh, we saw the Mirai last year at the auto show. Um, I was able to see it. I couldn't touch it, nor could I. Dr or look under the hood. <laughs> yeah, nothing. You know, they had this uh, uh, stanchions all around it. Um, but I think that's important for people to, yeah. to see. And, you know, there's a number of different fuel efficient uh, and um, <clears throat> renewable uh, vehicles that are shown at the show, as well as those very fast vehicles as well. Um, but people need to see it. Right. So if you can get that garbage truck converted, if you can get, uh, um, you know, some of our bigger uh, buses converted. Uh, I mean, you're going to convert the, you're converting the, the volcanoes, right. um, uh, buses, you right. know. And, and Rep Nakashima, your old sure. cohort from the state legislature, he's still leaning forward on the Big Island, and I still think the Big Island is going to be ahead of Oahu in many ways on hydrogen uh, infrastructure. One of the Helion buses that's being worked on is going to operate around between Kona and Kona Airport is going to be hydrogen fuel cell powered. There's a, a hydrogen station being built at Nelha by HNEI. Oh, that's great. Um, the airport folks are, are, they've already done master planning to include hydrogen in all their support vehicles. And then there's an initiative called the uh, Waimea Nui Sustainable uh, Energy Project that Blue Planet's working on up there. And there's some other uh, subdivision that they're looking at making microgrids and using hydrogen. Right, and so right. the Big Island is leaning pretty far forward on a lot of this stuff. So, you know, it's, it's exciting for me to be that close to it and see everything mm -hmm. going on. But now we have to make sure that that picture gets painted to right, everyone right. so you, you see it. Well, the Big Island's fortunate because they also have geothermal, right. um, which we consider as a renewable source. It's non-petroleum. So, um, you know, a significant portion of their electricity usage is coming from renewables. Um, and it can only get bigger. I mean, it just depends on, you know, the county and the state and, and the people of the Big Island. But they're one of the very few. I, I know we have hot spots in other islands. Including Oahu. Right. Um, I don't know if it's hot enough. Um, but definitely uh, the Big Island is very fortunate to have that power source. Yeah, the University of Hawaii did some studies back in the mid-70s that included Oahu. Um, it has several hot spots. They're a little deeper. Mm -hmm. May not be quite as hot, but hot right. enough to right. do geothermal. One in Waianae, one in Pearl Harbor, believe it or oh, not. Okay. And Bellows, uh, also, and Diamond Head Crater. Wow. There's at least four of them on Oahu. And the, um, the National Guard, not the Air National Guard, but the National Guard actually was considering proposing something on Oahu using renewables as a military project. And again, it's just notional at this point. They're just thinking about it. But they pointed me to that study, and I, I read the study, and I was blown away that I had no idea that we had those kind of options here on Oahu. Yeah, so, you know, my role as a congressman, uh, our role as a delegation is really to support our state and our country, and specifically for energy, uh, and, and, and more specifically for transportation. Um, we're looking for projects. Uh, and. It, it, Actually, it's a lot easier if it's tied to defense. So if there's an opportunity to um, get the, uh, uh, the National Guard or what you're doing on uh, Hickam, or Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, um, and if you need federal support, uh, you know, we, can, we can work on funding it. Uh, we can't do earmarks, right. so we can't specify where the particular project's going to be. But if you're the one leading the charge across the nation, we can kind of make it so that it, it, it works. So I encourage your, your viewers, I encourage you and others uh, throughout the, the state um, to look at ways where uh, we can, as a federal delegation, help you. We're, we're right, in the, right in the midst of going into the, the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, we have um, the big hearing in, in mid-April. Um, and it's during that time that we'll have the opportunity to start inserting language that hopefully in the end will provide us with opportunities just like that. So just keep that in mind. You know, this is the first time that I've seen a whole page worth of tweets come across. I can't even read them fast enough. So, <laughs> yeah, what, Zuri, why don't you grab one that, that you've been looking at? And, and Okay. And you can put it up there. I, 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 I think that... Uh, you know, 
just like uh, renewables and what you're doing, um, social media is, you know, doing the same thing. Um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily new, but for the general public, it's quite new. So, uh, you know, the more, pe more people that can be exposed to Twitter or to Facebook or, or to Instagram or whatever, the more people that can be exposed to, um, you know, what you're doing, uh, the better off we'll be. Uh, we're trying our best in, in Congress uh, to, to be social media savvy. Um, and, you know, it'll just grow exponentially. Mm -hmm. But there's a home component to that, too. So it starts in the home. So what do you, what do you teach your children? And what do you, teach, what do, you do with your family and, and clean energy? And you know, that's a very good story. I used to talk about it a lot. Um, nowadays, I don't think I need to say it so much. But it really uh, uh, <clears throat> began after I got back from my deployment in 2009. And we, uh, uh, I wanted to. My wife was a little bit unsure, but I wanted to put PV panels on my roof. And, you know, she was uh, unsure. And I said, you know, it, it's supposed to work. We're supposed to put these panels on our roof. And it's supposed to create electricity. And our, our uh, bill is supposed to go down to nothing. Or, you know, it'll decrease. And I said, well, just give me a chance. You know, I made, I made this money in deployment. Let me put some of it in. And if it works, it works. Um, but before that, because it took about two months to, to get the panels on our roof, I started talking to our kids, and I, I told them that, you know, we should treat electricity as we do water. Before, we used to leave the faucets on all the time, and now we're a little bit smarter, you know, mainly because of uh, our educa e education and the importance of uh, saving water, especially during drought conditions. But the same thing should be stressed for electricity. So, you know, if it's not necessary, we turn off the electricity. You know, when we did that for two months, we reduced our energy usage by one third in our house. Now I converted everything uh, from um, uh, from CFL to LEDs. So um, most of ours, maybe about ninety percent of our fixtures in our home are now LEDs. Oh, great. Um, so that was part of the savings. But that's before we even put panels on. And when we put panels on, two two months later, my wife was telling all her friends. Hey, you got to check this thing out. Now, I was the second person in Newtown in IAEA to get it. So, you know, we had to go through a, a, a lengthy process to get it approved. Now it's quick, you know. Uh, it's quick with the association because they have a standard um, okay. procedure. You don't have the to go through the association. community association. Yeah, you're right. That was another learning curve. <clears throat> right. It was very difficult at yeah. the beginning. Um, but we also put a whole house fan in. Yeah. Um, back then I had, um, you know, had, I had, was growing my, our vegetables and we had a, a worm bin. Um, the warm bin dr dried up, um, so I put the worms into the ground. Um, but, you know, we were doing all of that. My parents have um, hydroponic. Um, Great. You know, so we as a family are doing things. But, you know, I, I just want to stress uh, to people a couple things. The first thing is we can all do our part in uh, saving uh, electricity and in and, and doing so saving money personally. And that's right? the first step you make in that's before right. you put the renewables in. That's right. Um, and, you know, we have solar water as well. You, you do solar water even before you right, put PV exactly. in because the savings are tremendous. Um, but but the, other, the, the other thing that I want to stress is that, um, you know, we need to work together. And as a community, not everybody has the opportunity to benefit because I own a single family house. Right. I have my own roof. Not right. everybody what has that. We have condos, condos and apartments. And apartments. Yeah. <clears throat> So I, I supported, I introduced the very first bill uh, that now became Community Solar um, uh, for a number of reasons. I, I knew the benefits of solar panels. I wanted to make sure that the community benefited as well. So uh, we have now uh, a community solar project, that, the, a program that passed the legislature. Um, but the other thing is renewables as a... Uh, uh, what do they call it when it's it's big utility grade yeah. uh, utility grade projects commercial grade. commercial grade projects help everyone yeah. um, and it's no longer my focus to focus on the individuals it's more important for me to focus on the community uh, because if a community if, if we get a utility grade or a community grade project everybody benefits and we've got to look at everybody exactly uh, yep so those are the two things that uh 
you know, I've, I've learned over the years because of my experiences in my own home. Yeah. Well, believe it or not, we've, we've blown through 45 minutes <laughs> of talking, not, not knowing it would take that long. But Zuri, can you throw that photo up again? This is an old uh, family heirloom picture that uh, from <laughs> when Congressman Takai and I were, were both still in uniform together in, uh, in a conference we helped host over here. So, so uh, just so that everybody knows, I, I was uh, helping run this conference, but General Osterman was actually our chair. And uh, that conference brought thousands of people to uh, Hawaii and to the convention center. We actually made about $25 million for the state. But the important thing is, if we didn't bring this conference, and it was 2013 in September, um, people wouldn't have had that experience. We extended it based on your leadership to our first responders, yep. to our government officials. We ex expanded it to our active duty military. There's nothing like the National Guard Conference, the National National Guard Conference. So we're actually putting in another bid Good. for 2021, and you're going to be the chair? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, we're plumb out of time. Uh-oh. I'm feeling really old today. <laughs> Happy birthday! Like, it's your birthday! We got, we got cupcakes. Happy birthday oh, to Stan great. Osterman! <laughs> oh, that's great! Yeah, I'm feeling really old today. Happy birthday! Is 21? 23. Thanks for being Come on here. in, ladies, so we can see you on oh, thanks screen. Thanks for inviting me. Come closer birthday. to Mark Takai, please, Congressman. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mahalo.